So hello everybody. I will just give people another minute, I would think, just to join us. I can still see the numbers going up. Um, anyone who wants to feel free to say hello in the chat. You could um, say, you know, uh, what, what brought you to, to want to come to the event today or just where you're from or what you're looking forward to. Just to introduce yourselves in the chat. It's always nice to um, hear who's here especially when we can't see each other um, as easily. I will introduce myself in a minute, but in case you're wondering who I am, I'm Rachel King and I'm the Mental Health Portfolio Lead and I'll be chairing this for you. Nice to see so many people here this morning. we've got quite a busy morning so I think all things considered we're just it's slowing down on the people joining hard to know I hope everybody's had a chance to get a cup of tea settle themselves in introduce themselves in the chat if they like lovely to to be here with you all this morning I've been really looking forward um to this session I think we've got a really interesting set of to hear from and I also think the focus of today is really really interesting as well um, I think you'll see from the the guest speakers list there that we've got a number of organizations and we'll be talking about working across organizational boundaries um, and utilizing all sorts of, of um, activities and creativity to look at the way we can support particularly young people. And I think that is a really, really interesting and well worth thinking about topic, especially in this area. So for those who missed it the first time around, my name is Rachel King. I'm the Mental Health Portfolio Lead within um, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and I will be chairing this morning's session. Um, it's great to see so many people here. We've now got over 80 people on the call, which is amazing. This is one of a number of our early intervention in psychosis uh, national network events. We've been holding them on different topics that are relevant to understanding how to support people with first episode psychosis. The reason that we are doing that is because um, in the iHub in Healthcare Improvement Scotland, we have a programme of work called the Early Intervention in Psychosis programme, which has been funded um, by Scottish Government since 2018. We did a phase one where we understood what was happening across the country in terms of supporting people with first episode psychosis. And we're in phase two now where we're really looking at how best to get the evidence around what supports people well into local areas. So we're working with two areas specifically, but we're also doing this series of um, sessions looking at what does it mean to support people with first episode psychosis? What are the things that people need in order to continue to have um, agency in their lives, continue to have choices in their lives and continue to have things like employment and education as well as meaningful activity in their lives? And that is what we're looking at, particularly um, this morning. Um, before I go on, and introduce the speakers and introduce the flow of the day. I believe there is a little bit of housekeeping to do. So I'm hoping we'll be able to, that's it. So just so that you all know, this session will be recorded and by being here, um, that will be part of, of what happens. Um, so that means that there will be a recording of this session made available following this session. So um, if that means, you know, if you have to leave for whatever reason partway through, you will be able to hear the whole session. And we do hope that as many of you as possible will stay, not only to hear all the speakers and to hear the links between them, but also then to be able to put, hear and um, contribute to the questions that we have at the end of the session. Um, as you can see, it's a very simple setup for those of you that don't often use Teams at the top of your screen. I hope you can see next to a little people icon, a little chat icon. 
and if you have a question if you have a comment put it in there we have people who are monitoring that chat and we'll be bringing together some of the questions and we'll be trying to look at what the themes around those questions later but also if there are any technical problems if you can't hear properly if there's something going on that you don't understand do put your question or your comment in the chat that's brilliant um, we are asking people because there are so many people on the call just to keep their cameras off um, in the main part apart from the speakers um, so that we can all focus on the people who are speaking an event like this takes an awful lot of work and effort and preparation so as well as thanking um, the speakers three of whom you can see on the screen there I'd also like to thank the Early Intervention Psychosis National Team. There they are in all their beautiful glory. So you will find all those people on this call today. Ashley, who is the delivery lead for the programme and um, the rest of the team who make up um, all the different elements that are really key to understanding how to improve um, access, service and outcome for people who are experiencing first episode psychosis. We're also lucky enough to have Susie Clark and Rajiv Krishnadas from the Esteem Service as part of the team who are part of the Esteem team who are here today. Thank you, Susie. Um, and today would not be possible without the work of Deb, Andrew and Andra um, who are in the background and who will be able to in a much better way than I ever would be able to answer your technical problems and also help with the smooth running. So thank you all. It's great to be here. And um, I'm now going to just give you an introduction to the four speakers. So we are lucky enough this morning to be able to hear from some people who are who are already working in the NHS Esteem Service. And for those of you who don't know Esteem, it is Scotland's only early intervention psychosis service. It is in Greater Glasgow. Um, and it has been running for quite some years now, um, really with great outcomes for people and with great inputs for people, both of which are really important. So we have Fiona Morris from the service here today, who is a CPN at Esteem. We also have David um, Breckenridge, who's from Venture Scotland, which works with young people um, looking at activities and um, with a particular focus on outdoors, working in Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, and he has been linking up with some of the work that the other organisations have been doing. We also have Fiona MacDonald, who um, works in the Commonweal. Um, her focus is on music and activities, and she again links with Esteem, um, which is great to see the way that there are arts and creative and activity based organisations who can link with health and wellbeing organisations to make a real difference to the to the things that are on offer for people and also for what people can then see themselves doing following and um, being in any sort of NHS service. And finally, we have Mags Duell, who also works at um, Esteem as a youth employability coach. And we'll be hearing from all of them this morning. And I am honestly delighted as someone who has worked um, in and around youth services and in and around services that are in that transition age between 16 and late 20s, um, whether that's students, whether that's young people, whether it's people transitioning from CAMS into adult services. The idea of looking at people's needs in the round, the idea of looking at the way in which we can support not just a, uh, a mental health problem or a mental illness, but the things that make someone who they are in order to help them grow and develop and keep a part of themselves, regardless of what else is going on for them, I think is really key to understanding how to support not just mental health, but well-being. And also it's something that I, I, I think we see in pockets, but we don't see across everywhere. And it's something that certainly we could definitely do with more of, particularly perhaps in these straightened and challenging times. So. I think I would like now, I'm just waiting for the slide to move on, we'll see what happens, to introduce the speakers and to say 
um, please do put your questions in the chat for the speakers. Please do listen this morning with open hearts and minds and please do um, follow up on anything that you hear from today. Thank you very much, all of you. And I believe I'm handing over first to Fiona Morris. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Fiona Morris and I am one of the CPNs in the STEAM service, which is an EIP service covering Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And as you know, we work with young people aged 16 to 35 for a two to three year period. I suppose if we think about recovery, we know that recovery is not only um, viewed in terms of symptomatic recovery, but also in terms of personal and social recovery. And it's really important as a service that we make sure that the interventions we provide help support young people in their personal and social recovery with an emphasis on um, young people. So we need to make sure that um, the interventions we provide are youth friendly. So for many years within STEAM, um, we've been offering a wide variety of interventions, such as low intensity psychological interventions, uh, psychoeducation, family work, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We've also um, been offering quite a few esteem run groups, activity groups. These include badminton, a walking group and a social activity group. And I think um, we've all found these groups to be really beneficial um, for the recovery for our young folk. They tend to be quite a, there tends to be quite a low threshold for these groups. People can join as and when they feel able to do so. Um, it allows them contact with their peers and it also allows us, I think, a wider assessment of somebody's strengths and perhaps difficulties. So more recently or over recent years, we've branched out more into joint partnership working with third sector organisations. And first of all, um, David and I are going to have a chat about the project that we've done recently. Um, so the most recent project with Venture Scotland, how did that come about? And that actually started off as a very different project in 2020. When we um, had the opportunity, we heard about a really exciting opportunity involving a charity called uh, the Surden Sailing Trust, who are based down in Plymouth. And they were offering EIP services in Wales, England and ourselves in Scotland, the opportunity to um, be part of a um, project that involves sailing around the whole of Britain. So each team would take a week long um, part of that, that journey and be involved with the sailing crew and sailing the ship round Britain. So we thought this was really exciting and we thought it would be good to apply for this. We thought that it would really help support the group to experience things like a regular routine, fresh air, good food, a friendly social environment, we would have a shared sense of purpose with strong and safe leadership and peer support. It would give us the chance for wider, a wider range of new and challenging physical and emotional experiences. And I suppose learning new skills to deal with these new challenges. For example, we would be offline, there would be no alcohol, there would be no drugs. So we thought this was a good opportunity and we made an application and we were successful. The next issue, though, that came to hand was how do we fund this? How do we do that? And that's when we then applied to the Queen's Nurse Institute for Scotland and they run a, a Catalyst for Change programme, which is really aimed at community nurses who want to develop a project within their working environment. So we made an application to them and again, luckily, we were accepted for that. So the application at that time, and this was on the advice of the Surgeon Sailing Trust, was for 11 young people and four members of the STEAM team to go and take part in this sail around Britain. 
Um, we started a lot of pre preparation work and we don't have the time to go into all that today, but there was certainly a lot of preparation went into this project. We um, set up a, a working party, a staff working party to help with the practicalities of getting ourselves ready for this. So that was looking at things like providing information sessions for those uh, young people who were interested in taking part because we felt it was really important that they knew what they were getting into. Um, thinking about practical issues such as travel, because we were going to be travelling from Peterhead to Oban on the sailing trip. So how do we get to Peterhead? How are we going to eat? How do we get the money for that? Um, and also, obviously, it's the NHS, so risk assessing, and we did lots of risk assessments. And amongst all this, I was continuing to meet with QNIS and the other project leaders, and we were thinking about actually longer term plans. What do we do after this project's finished? We also thought about how are we going to get ourselves practically ready as a team to do this project? You know, we didn't want to turn up on the day of travelling up to Peterhead, a brand new team of 11 young people and four staff who didn't really know each other. And I suppose that's when we thought about an organisation that's on our own doorstep, and that is Venture Scotland. And we knew about them, we knew that they did outdoorsy stuff, and we knew that they did team building stuff. And we thought, actually, can we approach them and ask them to help us a, get ready as a team so that we have the best experience possible when we're on this sailing trip? And B, can we ask them if they will perhaps work with us after the sailing trip? If the sailing trip has went well and the outcomes are positive, can we somehow work together to, um, to provide these kinds of activities for young people in the future? So that's what we did. We approached Venture Scotland and luckily they were very, very helpful and really keen to get involved with us. So as part of the preparation for going on the trip, we um, had three days with Venture Scotland where they got us ready as a team. Um, for two of those days, we went out to local parks and we engaged in all sorts of team building activities, which were also great fun. For the third day, we went on a fabulous trip up to the Fife coastline and we went to Ely and we went coasteering. Um, and it really, these things took us really quite out of our comfort zone for us all. Um, but I think by the end of the three days, we all felt more comfortable in each other's companies. We felt we could communicate with each other and we felt that we would make a good team going away on the sailing trip. So the day of the sailing trip came and um, we travelled up to Peterhead and unfortunately at that moment in time, COVID reared its head and it transpired that the crew had COVID. We spent quite a bit of time in Peterhead to try to problem solve this. Can we still make this work? Can we go ahead in some shape or form or another? And actually the decision was made that we couldn't and we travelled back to Glasgow. I think really fairly deflated and disappointed. We got home and we had contact with QNIS again the following day. To be honest, just to bring them up today and to let them know that our project had failed in many ways. And QNIS were absolutely excellent. They had been kept up to date about our journey so far. They knew about the work that we had done with Venture Scotland in the three days preparation. They were really impressed with that. The outcomes were good. So they agreed, well, they actually suggested that we transfer the funding to a project with Venture Scotland. And that's what we did. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass you over to David to talk about Venture Scotland and the project that we ended up doing together. And then we'll have a little bit of a look at the outcomes from that. So I'll pass you over to David. 
Good morning, folks. Um, thank you very much for coming along today. Um, I think I'm going to take the prize for the most branding behind me um, out of all the speakers, so I'll, I'll take that prize. Um, I also got the pleasure of um, showing you some pretty pictures, so hopefully that will help as well. Um, I'm going to talk today, um, hopefully, if this all works. There we go. Somebody's got it to our first slide. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about Venture Scotland, what we normally do, what we call our core programme. Um, and then I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about what we did with the STEAM team. Um, and as I say, show you some pretty pictures along the way. So um, Venture Scotland, we were, we were set up about 35 years ago um, as a volunteer based uh, charity. Um, things have changed in the outdoors. Um, we now all need to have tickets and uh, qualifications to take young, groups of young people out um, doing some crazy stuff. Um, but um, we're still running and um, we run a staff of about 15 at the moment. We're expanding um, having had some funding challenges in the last year um, and we're now running core programmes in both Edinburgh and Glasgow. And Esteem have always been one of our, our big referrers, um, referring young people in. Uh, we work with anyone aged 16 to 30, so um, it really is a really, really good fit. So we've always had that sort of relationship um, with, with Esteem in Glasgow since we've been through there. Um, so the programmes for anyone, um, really, you can see all the, the reasons why people um, uh, refer themselves into our programme. Um, it's quite easy to get into our programme um, if you just, young people can just turn up or they can be referred by other charities. And um, yeah, really, we're looking at young people who are just wanting to build um, what we reckon is now emotional intelligence. Um, a lot of our young people are, are really isolated, sitting at home. Um, have difficulty building trusted relationships and um, we're, we think we're quite unique. There's a few other outdoor organisations um, who do sort of out, short term outdoor stuff, but we do um, much longer term stuff. And um, so our programme, as you're going to see, is a year long. So we have a chance to build um, really trusted relationships with young people. Um, so our journey programme, which is our core programme, has four, four sections to it. Young people can choose to do as little or as much as they want of that programme. Um, challenge um, is, is five days long and it's five straight days. So um, this is the way of um, just getting young people in, getting to know them, finding out um, whether the programme is really suitable for them. Um, so it's two activity days. Uh, the first day is very much a, a, a beach day or a park day. Uh, we usually go climbing on the second day and then we um, we crack on and go away to a bothy for a couple of nights um, to to stay away in the middle of nowhere. Um, so Discover is the second stage. You can see that's a seven week part of the programme. Um, Discover is really the hardest bit of young people. We really ask them to look really hard at themselves and um, what they can and can't do, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, we, we do have some young people who who'll fall off the programme at this because they realise that they don't actually want to, to look at those difficult things about their lives. Um, but it finishes with a, a bothy trip as well. Um, and during Discover each week, they do uh, an outdoor, one of our sort of seven outdoor activities. Um, so they get a chance to do everything from canoeing to gorge walking to um, co-steering, as, as Fiona has previously mentioned. A third stage, um, also seven weeks long, um, is really starting to get young people to look outwards and, and <laughs> should I say, stop looking at themselves um, and start looking at the community around them and where that support might be. So we base this, um, because one of our uh, values is an environment, we tend to do community environment projects. Um, so the last group that we had, um, I think they picked up nine and a half thousand uh, wet wipes off of Cramond Beach um, over the space of about three weeks, um, which they were quite horrified about. Um, and then the final stage of the programme is, is a 14 week stage. It's going into leadership. It's taken everything that they've learnt over those, those first few months and putting it together. They um, do a practice expedition, they do a final expedition, and then they do um, an awards night at the end, uh, which they organise um, as much as they're capable of doing, depending. We're aware that every young person is different and every group is different. So we, we, we get them to work at the level that they can work at. So what did we do for the STEAM team? Um, so uh, day one was at Glasgow Green. Um, we went out and we did, um, a lot of it is about breaking down barriers. Um, so the first thing we do is a name game. We get to know everybody's name. 
um, we then start using that to build up slowly really, really simple activities and then we, we'll build it up. Um, I know we ended up skipping at one point and if you've ever seen um, 15 people all trying to, to run through a skipping rope at the same time uh, is quite hilarious. Um, and yes, we do have the videos to show it as well. Um, so the first day was very much about a team building day, uh, getting to know people and, and doing some classic Venture Scotland games that you can see in the, in the photos there. Um, if you wonder what they're doing in the top right hand corner, they're actually dancing. Um, yeah, we have a video of that as well, don't worry. Um, day two, um, we decided to, to really start pushing people outside their comfort zones. So day two, we went to do a thing called weaseling. Uh, for those of you that don't know, and most people don't know what weaseling is, it's essentially caving above ground. So um, it's about squeezing yourself um, through little spaces and um, through rocks. And we've got a course up near Loch Lomond that we use that is very progressive. So it starts very easy. First, first one is the middle photo there where you just uh, squeeze in um, between uh, two rocks and it ends up with a thing called um, the post box, which um, I can just get myself through and no more. Um, I wish I could see everybody's faces right now because quite often at this moment, there's about half the people going, there's no way I'd ever do that. Um, it is quite pushy, it is quite challenging, but we operate challenge by choice. And we don't push people off stuff. We don't force them to go through stuff. And um, all the young people that were with us were given the option of doing it and saying, um, "This is an opportunity that you might never get again. Um, take it as much as you can, um, and step outside your comfort zone." So we did the two days, and then we concluded um, with the the Bothy experience. I'm aware some people might not know what a Bothy is. So um, if you look in the top left hand corner, you'll see a little white building, a, a sort of rusty building next to it. That is our Bothy. Um, we are really, really privileged as an organisation. 35 years ago, we were gifted um, the rent on this in this building, which is uh, used to be an open Bothy. So a Bothy is a little house, um, generally in the in the mountains. Um, quite often used by shepherds, formerly used by shepherds. Um, they generally don't have electricity. Um, some of them might have running water, and if you're lucky, might have a toilet. Um, I'm delighted to say that um, our Bothy has both of those things, um, but there's no electricity, there's no phone signal. Um, and as you can see, it is set in the most beautiful surroundings um, at the bottom of Glen Etiv. Um, the mountains you can see at the top are the ones in Glencoe. Um, you can see bottom left, um, there's a photo of us sitting inside the Bothy. Um, our Bothy, because it's our own and it's locked, um, we can have all our resources there. So it's well stocked with coal and wood and candles. And so it's got um, most things that we need. But what it doesn't have is any food in it because we've got mice. So we have to carry that all in each time we go in. And then um, we're quite lucky, some volunteers um, spent several years building a thing called a Houf. So if you look bottom right hand corner, um, that is our Houf. It's a, a grass roofed um, timber structure that actually looks at the view up the glen. And when it's pouring with rain, uh, we can go in there and um, sit around a fire. And it's a pretty, pretty special space to sit in. So how do you get there? Well, that's the first challenge. So Glen Etta from Edinburgh um, or is, is about a three and a half hour drive. Um, it's 11 miles down a single track road and it used to be an hour's walk in. Thankfully, uh, the walk in has now been reduced um, because we've got permission to, to park somewhere else. Um, and you can see in the middle photo, um, we do carry everything in. You can see them carrying barrels and rucksacks and um, everything we need for the, the three days that we're going to be there um, has to be carried in. And if you look in the bottom right hand corner, you can see um, the walk in is boggy. And uh, that is a genuine photo of a pair of wellies that got uh, left behind and uh, the person had to step out of them when we had to jump in there and rescue their wellies. So um, it's it's quite a, a challenge um, just to get in. Um, what do we do? Um, so there are, are activities. So we do team building games and team building challenges. Um, we're also quite uh, lucky the house has got a pizza oven in it. So last night, um, at the Bothy, it's always pizza night. We hand make pizzas from scratch and then we burn um, a fire inside the pizza oven for three hours to get it up to temperature. And then we all um, cook our own pizzas. Um, you can see we play music. We've got guitars up there. There's nothing electronic in the Bothy. So we have no radio and we have no music. Um, it's, it's all what we make it when we go up there. So it's living life very, very simply. Um, and we have lots of games, but uh, lots of Bothy games. Um, if you can see the photos, um, the one in top right is a game called Spoons, which uh, we've now decided we shouldn't play last night before going to bed because it gets everybody's adrenaline um, rather high. So um, I'm just going to finish off with why does it work? 
um, and I hope these photos kind of kind of sum it up. The most important thing, um, if you see in the left hand photo, uh, we're all sitting around in a, in a circle. Um, we review everything we do, so every activity every day finishes with a review where we sit and we look at what we've done, how we felt about it, and what we might have learned from it. Um, it's lovely being in the Bothy. It's a lovely safe space. But um, people have to go back to their own lives, um, whatever those lives are, with all their challenges. Um, and it's what can you take back with you? What have you learned uh, being away in the Bothy experience that you can take back with you? Um, there's something about a group experience. Um, just having that same um, difficult experience where everyone has stepped outside their comfort zone is really, really important. And I think that's what really bonds the group together. As you can see, the photo of the, the whole team standing outside the house. Um, that was that was towards the end of our trip. So something about that um, having something in common with other people. And the two other things, um, it's definitely about connection. Um, I love that photo in, in the left hand side um, because that is staff and young people. Um, I, I do know from conversations after the Bothy trip that a lot of the young people were having conversations with each other away from staff. And, and they were like able to have those conversations because they all had the same diagnosis. They all had something similar in their experience, so their experiences were different. Um, and there was that bringing together of people and knowing that you're not the only one that's had that experience um, is really, really important. And the very last thing um, is this beautiful photo of a young person sitting on a log in Loch Etive. Um, and, and there's something about the Bothy that is special and I've tried to I've tried to capture what that is and it's something about connection with nature being away from phones being away from emails and just being in that mountain environment where everything's stripped back and and the pace of life slows down so it's definitely something about that um, humans needing that natural connection to, to the natural world that I think is really really important so I'm going to hand back to Fiona, I think, who is going to tell you about the outcomes. You're on mute, Fiona. Fiona, bring you. Yeah, that's it. Mike, sorry, sorry, sorry. So what difference did we make? So first of all, our group comprised of uh, 10 young people aged between 18 and 25. We had uh, four female patients and six male patients, all of whom were in recovery from psychosis and all were prescribed antipsychotic medication. All of the participants had experienced high levels of anxiety um, and some experiencing comorbid conditions such as depression and other health conditions. And none of the participants that took part were in education or employment. Most of them had financial constraints and actually the fact that there was no cost attached to this for the participants allowed, um, meant that nobody was excluded from taking part in this project. The other thing to note as well is that throughout the whole project, um, from meeting and greeting in the park and going weaseling, and the Bothy, David and Robin were the consistent members of staff from Venture Scotland throughout. And I think that was really helpful as well in building trust and relationships. So how did we get uh, feedback from our participants? And as we know, it can be really traditionally quite difficult to get feedback from people. So we used various means um, to get this feedback. Um, we used feedback forums that Venture Scotland already used for their core programme. We brought along a notebook where um, participants could write or draw anything that they were thinking or feeling at any time. We also kept a bit of a verbal re a bit of a record of the verbal feedback we got from participants. So as David said, after activities, folk would reflect. And we kept a record of that um, so that we could um, evaluate what we did. We also got verbal feedback from participant, participants in the weeks and months following the project. So we would be out on visits, for example, and the young folk that had participated in the project would start to talk to us about it and what their thoughts and their feelings were. 
We got observations from the wider esteemed staff um, in the weeks and months following the uh, participation in the project. And we also got written and verbal feedback from um, esteemed staff who participated. So at the end, I can't really see these slides actually, sorry. So at the end um, of the project, we the uh, the core um, the sorry I can't really see the slides I'm having to look through my own slides. Um, so at the end of the project, these were some of the outcomes that we had, and this was using Venture Scotland's um, own um, what's the word, David? Own our evaluation process. Evaluation. Yep. Thank you. So as we can see. 80% of the young people said their ability to get their voice heard had improved. Um, six out of 10 felt that their trust and relationships had improved. Seven out of 10 felt that their awareness of the possibility of change had improved. Nine out of 10 felt that their self-awareness self had improved. Eight out of 10 felt their social awareness had improved. And actually 10 out of 10 of the young folk that participated um, felt that their confidence had improved. Some of the quotes from young people include things like, I love the games we played, they were fun. I love the social aspect of it all. Somebody said, I loved going to the Bothy and being with a group, spending time somewhere else away from phones, eating well and being outdoors. Folk said getting to know everybody really well, making pizzas together, the plank game and the skis game, playing games and talking with each other, making pizzas and having a sing along as a group. So we actually got quite a lot of quotes from people. Oh. Other benefits I think that we noticed were that there was one young participant who was really, really keen to be part of this project. And one of the exclusions, I think, for the project is that there's no drugs or alcohol um, at the project itself. So this young person made the decision that they were going to give up cannabis because they really wanted to increase the chances of being part of this. So they did. They gave up cannabis in the months prior to this happening. And actually to date, they've remained abstinent from cannabis and they're now involved in a 12 week long art project, um, which is great. One of the participants also reflected um, that isolation had been detrimental um, to their mental health. And while we were away at the Bothy, they made the decision that when they got back home, they were actually going to join in more esteemed groups. And this young person ended up volunteering with Venture Scotland. Three of the participants um, after the project wanted to want to um, sign up and be part of Venture Scotland's core programme. And we're hoping that that's going to start up next year. Um, so it was. It was also observed during the project that participants, as David said, would be talking to each other about their experiences of psychosis with other other uh, other young people. And I think that's really, really important because I think a lot of our young people quite often feel stigmatised and isolated by their experiences. Esteemed staff also observed that following the project, there was increased verbal interaction when the young people were attending other groups. And we know that some of the participants are now keeping in touch with each other via social media. So what were the staff's reflections? So the staff reflected that the project gave us a really greatly enhanced opportunity for wider assessment of the strengths and difficulties of the young people that we support. And this allows us, therefore, I think, to be better able to tailor um, and improve the interventions that we offer moving forward. Another staff reflection um, was that one of the most important things for us was that the project reinforced how important it is for staff to actually take an active part in these groups. 
this wasn't just about staff making a referral to an organisation. Being a participant helped to break down the barriers and enhance therapeutic relationships. We shared challenges and goals. It lessened the barriers of us seeing each other as patients and staff. We learned to view each other as fellow human beings with all our strengths and all our difficulties. And I think, I really believe that that allows the young participants to see that struggles are a part of everyday life that we all go through and it helps them overcome their own adversities. The project was also really important for staff's professional development. With staff, um, particularly for myself actually, and having to write a report for the project, never having done anything like that before, it was really important. But staff also reflected that they enjoyed being away outdoors in a setting like this, and it made them think more about the challenges they faced in their working life and actually ways to overcome those challenges or to deal with those challenges. Andrew, it's not moving on, sorry. Thank you, thank you. So if we think about joint working and we think about what each organisation brings to joint working, both organisations brought their own skills and expertise to this project. I think the esteemed staff obviously brought the knowledge of psychosis and mental health generally and of young people's developmental trajectory. We're skilled at assessing and understanding and mitigating mental health risks. Our existing therapeutic relationships with the patient group allowed us to assess the suitability of the participants and complete the preparation work, of which there was a lot, um, which resulted in full attendance at this project. We knew and understood the requirements for a step-by-step -step approach in preparing the young people for this project. And it's also important for the participants that esteem staff are part of the project as this provides safety and security for the participants. Venture Scotland, they provided expertise and safety and the activities they offered and also promoted trust and relationships with the participants, participants by being consistent in their approach. So what next? So future plans. So after all of this, we would really love to do further joint working with Venture Scotland. And we've had some thoughts about this. We're thinking about a, a similar project, perhaps once or twice a year, because obviously we work with people for a two to three year period. Could we do a similar project once or twice a year? Is there a possibility for doing a monthly joint activity with Venture Scotland? We're thinking about further research into what we are calling adventure therapy. And one other important thing that's actually not written on here is just to let you know that QNIS are really, really keen to fund um, future working between Venture Scotland and NHS teams. And I think if there are any teams listening in today and you think that's something we would love to do with the people we work with, whether that be a big or small project with Venture Scotland, could you please put it in the chat and we can let QNIS know. Thank you. I'm going to hand you over to Fiona MacDonald now, who's going to talk about the Commonweal Music Group. Uh, hi, thanks very much, Fiona. Um, just to tell you a little bit to begin with about Commonweal and who we are and what we do. And uh, Andrew, if you could just take the slide off and I'll just I'll just talk to Cameron just now. So we are an award winning Glasgow based mental health charity founded in 2001 and we support people experiencing mental illness and dementia by providing meaningful activities with the aims of building skills, reducing isolation, improving well-being and challenging stigma. 
Our core values are care, equality, positivity and partnership. And we work in partnership with lots of different agencies. We've got four projects. We have bicycle building and repair, art, climbing and music. So I'm the music team lead for Commonweal. And we run participatory music activities in hospital wards and care homes and in community contexts. Just as a side note, all our community projects are open to referral from mental health support professionals. So if you're interested in finding more in general about what we do, please do look at our website and contact us after today. So specifically today, I'm going to talk about our Make Music Make a Difference project, which is our partnership project with NHS Esteem. We're pretty time limited today, so I'm just going to focus mainly on what our approach is and what happens in the sessions themselves, what the benefits we've seen are, and uh, if there are more in-depth things that you want to know about, then could you just put questions in the chat or please do contact us afterwards because I'm really happy to talk about any of this. So this partnership came about starting with a short 10 week pilot project in 2015 and then the current project has been running almost continuously for five years. We had two years of funding initially from Creative Scotland and then our last three years which have just finished have been with the National Lottery and we've worked with 41 esteemed service users over the past three years on that in that section. We are absolutely thrilled that we've just been granted another three years of lottery funding so that the project can continue to develop further. In terms of how the partnership works in practice, simply put, Common Wheel have secured the funding, we run the activities, we administrate and we evaluate. NHS Esteem communicate with us really regularly in various ways and they support participant engagement right through from making initial referrals through practical support at sessions and around sessions during young people's journey through the whole project. So why music as an approach? Well, it's a really potent shared area of interest for young people. It can be a bit of a unique hook into activity. A lot of young people have musical aspirations. Our approach at Commonweal in general is to offer opportunities to create and play and share music in the broadest sense. So that can literally be anything from activities like songwriting, group drumming, doing music production, to listening to music together, chatting about music together, sharing our experience of music together. And we work from the point of view that everyone is a musician. So all our activities are accessible regardless of what your previous level of experience is. And in your average session, we could have people who have no previous musical experience working alongside participants who have already played at a professional level. But everyone works together and contributes to the group. And what that has the power to give is the shared experience of creating something together, but crucially without the pressure of immediate social interaction. Uh, this is particularly relevant to working with our participant group of people that are using the STEAM service because a lot of our young people are really highly socially anxious and you can come to a music session and you can be part of creating something and interacting musically together without really having to chat if you don't want to. But we do find that then through the music, people build confidence and then the social interactions often build from that. So in terms of how the project works, we have one main core activity, which is a weekly drop in two hour group session. And then we've got some supplementary activities to encourage engagement in that and provide routes to move on, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So if I could ask David, uh, Andrew, to put up a, a picture slide here, I'm just going to show you our venue. So we work from Barclay 2 Studios in Glasgow, which is a big rehearsal complex right in the heart of the city centre, which has 14 rooms like the one that you're, you're hopefully seeing here. Uh, it's used by professional and amateur musicians and community groups alike. So literally when we're in the studio of a morning, we could have another community group next to us or we could have Lewis Capaldi. So it's not just a normalising community environment for our young people, it's a really exciting and vibrant and professional environment to work in. And they could even go and rent a room themselves if they wanted, because anyone can use the space. And if I can get Andrew just to take that picture down now. So our core approach is really to provide flexible activities. Our biggest lesson in this project early on was how unpredictable attendance was, that we can essentially have a different group 
every week that we're there, we could have one person turn up or five people or 10 people. And that could be any combination combination of our staff and the STEAM staff um, yeah. and also uh, the participants themselves. And regardless of the number that turn up, they might not be the people that we're necessarily expecting to see that day. Also, participants, motivations and interests and capacity to take part can vary even just session to session. Even things like the impact of medication can hit people week to week. So we always work in a participant centred and participant led way anyway at Commonweal and we're, we're responsive to what happens in the moment. But it's really important on this project, particularly that we are adjusting to participants' interests and needs week to week and that we're facilitating progression towards people's own goals at their own pace. So I thought maybe a good way to get a lot of information across is just to describe what happens at a session. Um, so four of our musicians arrive at the studio with everything that's available in the room that you saw in that last slide uh, and a variety of our own equipment that we bring with us. So we've got a whole range of activities possible that can be flexible to what people want to do on the day. Uh, we all have the most up-to-date date information we can get about who we're expecting, but there's a sort of moment of anticipation of, OK, who's going to turn up? <laughs> but we've got a really wide skill set on the team, which is four musicians, so that we're adaptable to what happens. Uh, my manager has said to me, it's sort of like having a, a rabbit ready to pull out the hat, but realising that you might actually need a zebra. <laughs> So let's say that today uh, the group arrives and we've got one brand new person who's never been before, who's come with their CPN and they're just not sure, but they want to kind of see what it's like and they don't know how long they're going to stay, but they're willing to, to try and take part. And then we might have another three participants who have already been a few times and they've met their OT at Glasgow Central Station and they've all walked along to the studio from there together. And then we've got one person arriving who has come entirely independently that's been coming along for a while. So when people arrive, uh, someone who's been before might have brought an idea. They might say, oh, could we cover this song today? Or I've been working on a lyric at home. Could we look and see if the group could develop this in some way? If there isn't an idea that immediately comes out of that, then we often start just with some open questions like uh, what instruments would people like to play today? Or what have you been listening to music wise this week? Can we put that song on through the sound system and all have a listen to it and see what we think? So during this initial period, our musicians are going to be thinking quickly about, OK, what's possible today? What are we going to do? And there'll be a period of negotiation with the group about some options for activity, and then we'll decide together what we're going to do for the next hour, hour and a half or so. Uh, and then we will split off and work on things. So let's say just that we're going to cover a song. We might have a new person might be interested in music technology, so we might set them and their CPN up on an electronic drum pad to do a bit of a duet together. We might have someone else who wants to try drum kit for the first time. We might have another couple of people who have been before and been doing some ukulele and so has the occupational therapist. So they start learning a few uke chords and, and building on those skills. Somebody maybe wants to sing. Uh, and then maybe somebody's there who's already an accomplished guitarist, so we could get them working on a guitar solo. And we split off and we work on our individual bits. Our musicians and the NHS esteem staff will be flexibly supporting in the room, uh, just as required with the musical aspects and also with any support needs that the participants have and the social interactions that might need to go on. And um, just keeping people chatting while they're waiting to get started on things, all that kind of stuff. So. During that whole time that we're working on something, maybe the new person that's arrived has decided that they want to leave a bit early, so they head off, that's fine. And maybe somebody else arrives part way through, an hour late that we haven't seen for a few weeks, and we just bring them up to speed and get them joining in. Uh, and maybe our guitarist has already mastered something quickly and says halfway through the session, oh, I've got this bit, like, could I try bass today? Yep, cool, okay, we'll get you set up to try that. Um, or maybe our guitarist has mastered something quickly and comes over to one of our musicians and says, while I'm waiting, could I help with anything? And we can say, yeah, that would be brilliant. Could you just keep playing these guitar chords over for me while I teach this person the, the tune? So we're all working together really throughout the session. At some point, we'll take a short break for some water and snacks and people can go and get a cuppa from the vending machine if they would like to. 
and then we'll come back together and pull the parts together and rehearse the song and make some decisions about how we're going to arrange it creatively. And if everybody's up for it, we'll throw a recording device into the middle of the room and we'll make a quick recording of what we've we've done. And then at the end of the session, we'll ask for some feedback, maybe what people might like to do next week. And then once people have left, our staff will evaluate how the session's gone. Uh, and we'll also follow up with the CPN of the new person who attended to check how they felt they got on and whether they'd like to come back. And we'll email the track we've created around everyone who took part so that they've then got a record of, of what we did. So if I can get Andrew just to put up again the slide of the studio before the session, and then he can flick to the after slide. So this is what the room looks like after a session, <laughs> which is usually merry chaos, everything's strewn about, uh, and hopefully everybody has left happy and feeling that they've achieved something and created something together. And whatever we've done, everyone has been equal participants. So that's our musicians, esteemed staff and our participants. And I mentioned briefly just that we have some other supplementary activities to the group session. So we've got flexibility in the initial engagement process. So, for instance, if someone wants to meet with us first before they come to a session or do an individual session or two to build confidence before the group, we can accommodate that. And also for regular attenders, we've got some opportunities for occasional individual or small group sessions to pursue special interests. Because one thing that we do realise about the really inclusive open group format is that maybe regu more regular attendance um, might have interests that come out of that that can't really be pursued in that format. We also provide opportunities to move on through some of our individual work, which I'll, I'll get to slightly later on again. In terms of the benefits and impacts of the projects, I would hope that from describing that example of a session, a lot of them are really self-evident. So our young people are getting access to free, high quality, highly supported music activity provision with professional musicians. And there is no way they would get that anywhere else. Uh, and through that, they can develop obviously their music skills, but also practical skills like independent travel around the sessions that esteem help work towards. There's life skills involved, you know, focus, perseverance, teamwork, decision making identifying and moving towards personal goals, structure and routine, building up agency and resilience. Uh, we try to build on people's strengths and encourage our young people to share skills with each other. And they can connect with others, they're socialising, there's peer support that happens in the session. They're also connecting with the wider community because they're coming to this city centre venue and interacting with other people there. And we hope through all that they build confidence and we then frequently see that what happens in sessions, the benefits move outwards into people's everyday lives. So people pursue music interests in their own time. They buy instruments, they work on music in between sessions. Uh, they make and share music with other people. Uh, we've had people go on to write songs with friends out with the project, um, to work with a professional producer, join a band, to release their own music via their own social media platforms. People have also uh, reported that the project helps with self-management of their illness. So either using the activity as a distraction from or even to alleviate some of the symptoms and also as a means of just self-expression. Uh, people form friendships and also people progress on to other things. So other group activities, volunteering, education and work opportunities and common wheels got a really big network of organisations that we work with so we can help with signposting and things like that. So just to give two concrete examples, we had one young man who became really interested in a particular type of electronic music production that we couldn't really do in the in the main group so we arranged an individual session for him and uh, while he was working with the musicians I chatted to CPN about signposting options and afterwards they went away and looked together and he signed up to a six-week short course that was provided by a mainstream education provider. Um, or to give another example, we've had two um, young gentlemen who've gone on to work in the music industry. And apart from the music activities that we offer, our musicians are able to chat to people about what it's like to work in the industry, what the challenges are of being freelance versus employed, 
uh, you know, how to take care of yourself as a musician within the industry. So all that kind of background work um, can really support someone to explore what, what they want to do um, out with the sessions as well. So to summarise, I guess, what we've learned and the, the core approach for us, it's about rather than specific activities, providing a safe, creative space for people that's consistent and meeting them where they are at every contact. And around that, the, the approach really is very flexible and the outcomes are very flexible. We're always offering and encouraging, but without pressurising. And one of the other big lessons is accepting disengagement as long as we've done what we can to reduce barriers, but always leaving the door open for people to come back because it's a long term project. So we're trying to inspire people's confidence to explore their own interests and empower participants to use music in ways that are meaningful for them and encourage them to engage with the project how and when they want to. And what we've then seen from that in terms of engagement patterns is in the short term, the project really immediately accessible. Someone could say to their support worker, can I come tomorrow? Yep, no bother. And even one attendance can be a significant event for someone in terms of taking a risk and trying something new. In the longer term, though, there's real relationship that builds up with our participants that is this flexible relationship throughout the recovery journey. And we've seen people dip in and out of the project across the whole timeline, you know, across several years, because it's a safe space that they can come back to um, and engage at a level that they want to at any particular point. Also, people have asked to stay on after they've been discharged from NHS Esteem, which we have so far had the capacity to facilitate. And Esteem have told us that that can be quite a tricky transition period for people when they're moving from Esteem into CMHT care or care of a GP. Mm -hmm. So the project can provide this uh, kind of point of continuity through the discharge process as well. So just to kind of round off, Fiona's talked about in terms of Venture Scotland about her perspective on working with the third sector, which is equally applicable to hear about what we each bring to the partnership. From our perspective as a third sector organisation, we can have a lot to offer, but we can also sometimes be seen either as you know, a resource to direct or refer people to or use, or even sometimes seen as an exit outcome. Whereas for us, this project has become a true example of what partnership working can be, um, of developing these mutually beneficial ongoing relationships of trust. And together, then we can reach the participants who are most going to benefit. Because our biggest challenge is literally getting people in the door. Most of the young people that come, at least at first, would not attend independently. When they're there, they engage well, but getting them there is a challenge. So we work in partnership to reduce barriers and we need that ongoing practical support from NHS team or we would a lot of the time be sitting in an empty studio. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, back in the first couple of years of the project, we frequently were sitting in an empty studio because <laughs> this approach has taken a, a bit of time to develop. But we now, over the last three years, have had 90% of our attendance, uh, our sessions attended, which we feel is quite a, a big achievement. Um, and through this partnership working, we can safely and effectively support participation. We can focus on the specialist provision that we offer because esteem keep everyone safe. Uh, and then not only during the project, but that relationship continues past the project timeline, because at the moment we're not running. One set of funding is finished and another set is about to start. But in the interim, we're doing this webinar together today. Um, and also, if resources come my way that I think Esteem would use, then I forward them on. They get in touch with us about signposting for particular participants they're working with at the give moment. you a one minute um, notice, Fiona, because we've got another speaker and then I yeah. know there's lots of questions. So if you can manage to wrap up, that would yeah, be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so uh, also participants going to um, participate in other other projects, you know, our musicians went on the Bothy trip. Uh, we've had someone play at Commonweal events um, and we've also got this partnership with the studio as well, which um, has been really productive. We were the first community group to use it, but we are now um, one of several who use it. So that's really challenging stigma as well. Um, finally, we're extremely fortunate to have long-term funding, but I would say to anyone interested in doing this, 
we started small, we've had loads of challenges and evolutions and funders are really understanding about that. So if you're interested at all in doing this, find the right partner for you and try it. And if the relationship's good, be willing to persevere in developing the approach. Development plans for us. Um, with our next few years of funding, we're going to widen access to referrals from out with Esteem. We're going to have a bit more in investment in individual and outreach work and small group sessions. We're going to incorporate volunteering, hopefully, and we're also really looking to find a way to evaluate and use the project, maybe as some kind of research project, because that's not something that we have expertise in, but we've got masses of, of really useful data from the last five years. Um, it's been a real joy to work on for us, it really has. Now, what I was hoping to do now, just to finish in the last minute or so, was to leave you with a couple of slides of feedback from NHS staff and part participants while a little one minute track plays that we created in a session. And that was created in an online session inspired by a picture of the sea that was behind a participant in their Zoom. And they wrote this little tune called Under the Sea in an hour and a half in the key of C. And I'd like to just ask Andrew to put up those slides for you to read and just play that, that little track. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Fiona. That was amazing and it was amazing to hear. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask that we pass over to Mags. Thank you so much, Fiona. I imagine we'll be coming back to you in the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I am aware that we are running a bit over. If people have got questions to put in the chat, if you do that just now, we should have around 10 or 15 minutes for questions. I know. And if anyone wants to do a little virtual round of applause there, that was amazing to hear. And amazing to hear what can be done in an hour and a half. I'll hand straight over to Mike. Thank you. Hello everybody. Um, my name's Mags. I am the youth employability coach within the team at Esteem. Um, to give you a little bit of background about how my role came about, um, it's funded through the Young Persons Guarantee which is the Scottish Government's initiative to ensure that each 16 to 24 year old in Scotland that faces any type of barrier has got somebody or a service um, to support them to reach what we call a positive destination. Um, so although my role is an employability coach, employability doesn't always mean employment. That for us can be anything from training, volunteering, further education, um, or obviously reaching that goal of a job as well. Um, bear with me, just making sure these slides are in the right order. Um, so why is employability part of the early intervention for psychosis model? Um, it is built into the model that a, a person sitting within the team should be focusing primarily on employment. So essentially to make sure that there is somebody within the team, the, the team that they're already engaging within for their, their mental health condition, um, that they can get a bit of advice, signposting or some intensive work around reaching their next sort of vocational goal. Um, the importance of the integration. I think for me, my background is delivering employability um, for clinical teams, maybe not sitting within the same office, maybe taking external referrals. Um, 
and that that did work but I think some of the barriers that esteem had faced in the past was that communication making sure that we're working we're working with vulnerable young people who may be quite early on in their recovery um, from first episode psychosis when they're starting to think um, about their next steps, whether that is volunteering, training, education. Um, so just making sure that as an employability specialist, my role can be quite boundaried. If I ever face um, a young person at a meeting that I think I'm a little bit concerned about their mental health or they're maybe um, displaying slightly differently from um, my sort of usual interactions with them, I feel that I have got somebody there that's that's well placed to be able to have that clinical input, um, and it's great because I sit within the same office as the this um, esteem south and esteem north team. So there's always somebody on hand, whether that be the person's key worker or whether that be um, the duty nurse at the time as well. So there's always somebody that I can fall back on to just ensure that my, my role is very bounded to employability and there's not any sort of clinical overlap there, which is great. Um, Examples of the importance of integration. So I attend the, the weekly MDT meetings um, with the multidisciplinary team, which gives an opportunity for the key workers, the clinical staff to say to me, how do you think the person's doing? Um, or they can give me a wee bit of feedback on how they've found them and we can take a joined up approach to how we're interacting with that young person. It also gives me the chance to feed back to the, the key workers about some of the success stories, some of maybe the, the barriers that we're facing with young people and able to get a bit of sort of advice on how to handle that as well. Um, so that is great. Um, so what can a young person expect from myself? So what would happen if someone was interested in thinking about that next sort of vocational goal? Um, our CPNs, OTs, any of the key workers, psychology, psychiatrists will have a wee chat with um, the young person if they've got any interest at all in anything from regular activity right up to employment. Um, the CPN or any other key worker would have a wee chat with me initially. We'd quite often have a joint meeting with the young person, very informal, no pressure, just around what my role is, what we can offer and we go from there. It's a tailored one-to-one -one employability support for that young person. So it can be very different for, for each person. Some people that I work with, I work on something called the employability pipeline. So you've got stage one to stage five. So stage one would be a young person who maybe isn't leaving the house an awful lot, hasn't got some regular activity in their life. We would think about even things like Venture Scotland and the music group. We would also think about utilising other third sector organisations to, to kind of get them up and running and um, getting something, even if it's a day a week. We then think about moving on to stage two and stage three, which is looking at CV building, application skills, um, and then moving on to that sort of thinking about work or thinking about the next step. That could be education as well. Um, one of the other key components of my role is employer engagement. So. One thing that was really sort of a focus when, when I began my role was about ensuring that we're working with a young person to make a sustainable choice for them. A choice that's we're looking at jobs that they want to do, not just the jobs that are on the labour market. You're not thinking about, OK, here's a job in Tesco, it's five minutes from your house, ideal, let's apply. It's more about sitting down and thinking about what do you want to do with your future? What skills have you got just now and what employers could I reach out to on your behalf to start to think about, OK, what is that employer looking for? Are they looking for particular training or experience that you maybe don't have at the moment? Can we work on that to break down that barrier? And just as well to make sure that I am bringing employers to young people that are mental health friendly. It's a big conversation that I have with a lot of the employers that I interact with around what are their HR and their, their mental health policies um, to ensure that when I'm speaking to a young person who might be quite anxious about entering employment, quite anxious about the thought about thought of disclosing their mental health issue to an employer, to give them that sort of peace of mind. So that is where the employer engagement side of things really plays a big part. Um, another fantastic part, I think, and I think it's integral to each young person's sort of journey with myself, um, is referral out to appropriate courses and training opportunities. There's only so much that I can provide to a young person. I can sit down and I can 
do their CV, I can work out where do their skills and their strengths lie. We can do application skills, mock interviews, all that sort of stuff. But I think there's nothing like getting them out into a peer environment again, especially with those young people who have maybe left school and, and maybe struggled with school. Um, maybe left school and not done an awful lot since um, and obviously facing that barrier of becoming unwell, getting them back out into places like um, Celtic Foundation, the Rangers Cashback Programme, the Prince's Trust, Action for Children um, in Glasgow Life, just to name a few of the organisations that I utilise quite often. Um, to give you some examples of that, talked about the employability pipeline and sort of where young people can sit. Um, so if I'm working with someone who's stage one, um, really quite far removed from the labour market, uh, a programme that I've utilised recently, which I found really fantastic, which is open to, to any young people within this sort of greater Glasgow area, is Action for Children's Deeper Connection programme. That's working on really soft skills leading towards sort of employment, um, but working on sort of managing um, their anxiety and their confidence and things like that. Some really light touch stuff right up until the sort of Prince's Trust, which is another opportunity, um, another organisation that provide opportunities from Explore courses, which is what it says in the tin. It allows young people to go along and explore different industries, um, allows them if they maybe don't know what they want to do, they focus on different areas. They can do retail, hospitality, health and social care, engineering. Um, and I think more recently they've been in partnership with Arnold Clark. So that Princess Trust opportunity has given them a sort of wide range of being able to kind of find out what they would like to do, what industry they would like to work in, but also giving them that sort of peer environment again as well, which I think is really important when getting somebody ready for work. Um, and the next part um, for everybody that I work with once we do reach that positive destination is that sort of ongoing support. It's not OK, you've got a job or that's you started education again. See you later. It's about let's think about how can we support you to sustain this? So when you're thinking about the ongoing in work support, I like to do a thing which is called a healthy working plan, which is something if someone is happy enough um, to disclose their mental health to their employer, we would sit down with their key worker and develop the healthy working plan, which looks at things such as um, early warning signs for that employer to look out for. How would that young person like the employer to respond? Um, and some key contacts within a STEAM, just to ensure that if there is ever any concerns for their mental health, when they reach that next um, step of their life, then there's, there's still that communication happening. Um, and for education, more recently, over the last few months, I've had um, a good few young people move into college um, and university. So it's just about utilising those disability and wellbeing services and ensuring that I'm I would usually go along with a young person to the meeting just to make sure that they're able to sort of communicate their, their difficulties and, and their barriers effectively to make sure that we can get a bit of a plan of action in place to ensure that the university and the college is best placed and, and, and best supported as well um, to be able to support that young person. So case studies. So I'm going to talk very briefly um, about two, two different people that I have worked with um, since my role commenced in July 2021. Now, the only thing that these two people have in common is that they have suffered first episode psychosis. They otherwise are very, very different. Um, the first young female had no qualifications from school, no prior work experience, um, but in recovery from first episode psychosis and, and engaging with the team at STEAM. So we had kind of thought about what would she like to do? So so basically visited a, a long at home visit um, with our CPN, sat down and talked about my role. What kind of things can we provide? Would it be volunteering? Would it be training um, or would it be education? So this is an example of where we put together an action plan and sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. And that's OK. I think with the right support around the young person, it's OK to try things and, and fail and get back up again. So. We had engaged with Glasgow Life, um, who are also a young person guarantee programme, um, which provide supported volunteering opportunities. 
Glasgow Life get a set advisor for the young person. They basically scout out an organisation that would be suitable um, and they provide um, a really heavily supported programme where the advisor would go along to the voluntary opportunity with the young person. But unfortunately, at that sort of stage, um, upon the sort of assessment from myself and the Glasgow Life Advisor, it maybe just wasn't the right time um, for this young person. And engaging with the team at Esteem as well, we had kind of thought, OK, we'll maybe take a wee pause on this. So the young person knew that I was there when they were ready. And um, she actually re-engaged a couple of months ago and is now um, studying flower arranging at college with one of the Love to Learn courses um, and will be attending in January again um, once that course is finished to work on a qualification, which is fantastic. Um, the other just, case study is... I'm just going to come in and say, if you've got another minute, that would be great. And then we've got about 10 minutes before we wrap up. Is that OK? No problem. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, so the second case study is a young male who was um, referred to me by his CPN, educated to upper high school level, currently working part time when he was referred to me um, and managing his recovery well um, within the community. So this is an example of a young person who was referred to me who actually had a job. So it doesn't need to be somebody who is currently not doing anything. He had a job, however, he was looking at more of the future. He was looking at what do I actually want to do as my career? I have no idea. Mags, can we sit down and talk about this? So we've done a lot of work on basically researching different industries, getting a couple of contacts from different um, organisations to be able to speak with them as well um, about their role, about what do they do? How did they get there? Um, and we had kind of finally come to the decision that he liked a lot of look, they, he liked the look of a lot of Scottish government jobs um so he went from working part-time um in retail to actually working full-time for the home office which is a fantastic achievement for anybody especially someone who had been through so much in the past year with their mental health so it's just to show the kind of the differences between people and the different goals um and that it is tailored to each individual person um, just some feedback here from referrers as well. So I take referrers, um, referrals from CPN, um, OT, psychiatry, psychology, peer support workers and support workers within the team. Um, so I won't read that out because I'm conscious of time, um, but you can just have a wee look there. And just quickly um, around, around our outcomes. Um, so I have engaged with six to eight young people within Esteem. 34 of those, unfortunately, out with the scope of the Young Persons Guarantee. What that means is they are either living out with the Glasgow City boundary or over the age of 24. However, I have had a meeting with each of those people and effectively given advice and signposting to an organisation that I felt could, could basically effectively support them. Um, 21 of those have engaged well in a one-to-one -one intensive basis and actually I didn't realise until I was doing the sort of data for this um, slideshow was that all 21 of them have reached a positive destination whether that be training, further education, um, a job um, or volunteering and I'll just leave that wee last slide there with some examples of the outcomes so you can see um, that it's not all just this is what's on the labour market, here you go. We really work um, on a one-to-one -one basis to see what that young person wants to do. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mags, and thank you all the speakers. Um, as the chair, obviously, I am uh, I'm clear that because we had so much to say from all the speakers and you can see the richness of what people were saying, we are quite over time. Before I hand over to Susie, I would like it if everyone could. Um, if you see at the top, you've got your reactions button and I thought we could give all the speakers a virtual round of applause up there because um, I, I think everything we said was excellent. Susie, we're going to hand over to you to do a couple of questions. Um, I would just like to say that what I was really struck by in those in those presentations was the fact that on the one hand, we could talk about people's anxiety, psychosis, comorbidity, the fact that people weren't in education or training, um, that there was financial constraints around their lives. And then you could talk about people going weaseling and sailing and being outdoors and doing music and having fun in the mud and working in partnership 
and thinking about the outdoors as well as um, indoor activity and that the quotes that were put up across the, the board from young people there was not a speck of interest in what their problems were in what they are facing in terms of their mental health it was all about they were being or doing or feeling um, or thinking differently positively and having fun and I, I just thought that is the most striking thing to me that this is about how we help other human beings have lives that are rich and have meaning to them Susie I'll hand over to you we've only got five minutes I'm really sorry we should do a write-up I think of the questions that have come in because there's lots of interesting ones that I've seen in the chat thank you thanks Rachel um, and thank you all the speakers um, it was an inspiring morning I have to say I've spent most of it with a smile on my face which is quite a uh, quite a thing because I've known about all this stuff for a long time but it's amazing when you really hear and see the commitment and enthusiasm for for this work and I think the reality is that that recovery is you know if you ask people what's important to them it's having fun making friends getting a job it's not reducing their medicine or having fewer symptoms so we need to get better at these types of things and one of the um, things that came across really clearly was in relation to the partnership working um, that somebody said something about the non-judgmental space and I do think that's valuable but it's, it also requires staff to have the time to go out and help that because we we will participate much more easily if we're not in our work roles so uh, that's the first thing I would say I've got a couple of questions for each speaker um, so in relation to Venture Scotland, I think, David, you've actually answered some of them on the chat that is it just available in the central belt? Could we possibly have a joined up group? And does Venture Scotland work with people with learning disabilities? Yeah, easy to answer those. So at the moment, Venture Scotland um, have our hubs in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, so our core programme is only available to young people within reach of those bases, um, although we will pay for transport and stuff like that. So we have had young people from quite a lot of um, local authority areas. Um, what was the second question? So my yeah, brain's joint group, so that's joint for a groups. discussion down the line, yeah, for yeah, different EI services. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I've put my uh, contact details up. I'm absolutely open to discussions about how we can make this work um, and overcoming those barriers. And the learning difficulty ones, absolutely. Uh, we work with a lot of young people who are on the spectrum. Um, there is a limit um, with regards to um, mental disabilities around um, how much people can process what they're actually going through. Um, because the, the, the programme is nothing about canoeing and climbing and all about building relationships. Um, so so that is some barriers there, but we're willing to talk to anyone to, to work out how we can make it work and to reduce those barriers. Thanks, David. That's great. Um, OK, um, so that's really helpful. Then we had another question around, can someone out with Glasgow attend a STEAM in these ventures? And hopefully the independent organisations will be able to speak to their accessibility for people that are out with Glasgow. STEAM is for NHS, GG and C, so that's not just Glasgow, it's the HSCPs that are linked to Glasgow, but it is the only early intervention service in Scotland until recently when Dumfries and Galloway and Tayside both started to develop EIP services. And I guess the purpose of today really is to highlight the early intervention approach to social recovery and showcasing these fantastic voluntary organisations and how they can support young people to recover. Um, and our ambition really is that EIP services are developed across Scotland and certainly somewhere like Lothian, I'd like to say is long overdue an EIP team um, so that we can um, help young people in Edinburgh access similar recovery based approaches. Um, in terms of the music group, Fiona, there was a question around about age limits for the group and whether there was anything similar in Dumfries and Galloway or if other people from other bits of Scotland could refer in. So this particular project that we've been talking about with Esteem is only for Esteem service users, but our main, although we're going to be opening access to referrals from some other agencies, but our main community music project any mental health professional can refer into or you know if you're a participant wanting to get involved um, even contact us and we can tell you a bit more about that we are based in Glasgow so the sessions take place at Gartneyville Royal Hospital but there's no geographical limit to where people can refer from you know so if you can get to the session then you can you can be referred in basically we're not Glasgow limited in that sense I don't know what other services there might be in different parts of the country I don't know of anything quite 100% like us, but 
again get in touch after the webinar we might be able to do a bit of signposting there that's great thank you thank you fiona um i think the other thing that would be um helpful to highlight is is one of the common themes was the partnership working between the nhs service and also the third sector and the fact it takes time and commitment and these established relationships that are so valuable and appreciated i think on both sides um what i'd like uh, and i know that we've had a long relationship with the music group and i'm very um i'm very glad of that and esteem because it's so helpful to be able to offer a range of different things to young people and support their attendance um, and finally i just want to acknowledge um mags um definitely it's um mags's addition to the service has been amazing in terms of really um highlighting and and the role of kind of vocational recovery and also reaching out to employers which is something that clinical staff just don't have time to do all the clinical teams in esteem really appreciate her input and her role here and i would encourage people in other bits of glasgow to in other bits of scotland to reach out and find out who their youth employability coaches are because actually these exist in almost all the city council areas so there's there will be um, youth employability coaches in other bits of the country that might be able to support the work you're doing with young people um, I think that's probably me wrapped up the questions as fast as I can, Rachel. Could I, uh, ha I hand over unless anyone's got a burning question that I've not included? I think uh, I'd like to say then thank you to each of the speakers. Thank you to Susie for that rapid fire Q&A there. I think we could all have stayed much longer and heard from you all. I'm aware that we're keeping people back and we said we would finish at 11. I would like to say thank you to the whole EIP national team for pulling this event together and for everyone from Esteem and from um, the other um, uh, the, the, the other parts that have put together this, this programme today. I'd also like to say thank you to Commonweal and Venture Scotland through uh, David and Fiona. And for people who want to follow up on anything they've heard this morning, please do. I think Debs has put in um, a link to our website. You can also find us um, through the EIP programme and it'd be great to hear um, from you. And thank you all, as Susie has said, to all the participants, to all of you for attending, for your great comments in the chat and for being here this morning. I found it really inspiring. I, like Susie, just you know have known about some of this work for a long time but it is so amazing to hear it brought together and to see the impact that it has on particularly young people's lives it's really really great to see um i've also been informed that i have to tell you to to uh, encourage you to do a little bit of evaluation of this morning i believe there's a link in the chat so anyone who would like to please do because as you can see from the quotes and the things you heard today evaluation does make a difference um, thank you all very, very much this morning to Mags, David, to the two Fionas, to Susie, to the whole team for putting this together and for everyone. For being here. Thank you all very much. And do feel free to take your mutes off and to shout bye as you leave the virtual room. I always think that's quite nice to hear who's really here. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.